know that the id is actually named after the benefactor of the library. Uh, Mariah Hastings Carey, you know, my understanding is that she actually provided the money for, to buy an initial portion of the books um, that became the initial part of the collection for the library. And the library has always been a very special place to my family. I grew up in Puerto Rico and you know, we had our school libraries, but public libraries weren't very popular. And I love, love, love to read. So to be able to move to Lexington when I was 12 and have access to this beautiful building with all of these books was really just a treat for me. And then to be able to come full circle and to name me in after a woman who was incredibly generous to the town of Lexington just seemed really appropriate to me. So I'm so excited that you're here. Welcome to our house. Um, the kitchen has been very busy. Um, thankfully, I love to cook. Um, I think I've made, I think we've done breakfast, lunch, and dinner probably since March 14th, I think is when I started really cooking full throttle. And it's been the highlight to be able to cook with my family and spend time with my family doing that. Um, as Mina mentioned, the kids have been doing a lot of cooking. I actually have been doing a series of cooking classes for our employees, not only at my property, but at our sister properties in Rhode Island, the Ocean House and the Week Pod. So twice a week, I get together via Zoom with our employees and we've been cooking. So I hope that everyone is healthy and safe. Um, and I'll look forward to spending the next hour with you talking about what I think is one of the most fundamental skills um, and actually one of the easiest things that a cook can do in their home kitchen. So what we're gonna do today is I am going to talk to you about chicken stock, beef stock, and vegetable stock, okay? So I have actually been up for a little while this morning, as chefs often are, sort of getting us ready for today. I had about 10 pounds worth of bones, and then what I did was I had about three or four carrots, three or four celery stalks, and I used the entire part. I did not peel carrots, I didn't you know, trim my celery, I used every piece of it. Same thing with the onions, I also used the skins as well. All right. So um, what I'm gonna do is I will, and I will be sharing all of my recipes. I have them all summarized. And I have them all set up and I will set, share them with Mina so that all of you um, can enjoy them and practice with them. So what I did was, as I said, I had it in the oven at 425. I roasted the bones. And what this does is it helps create like the, the um, it caramel, that caramelization that adds a really nice richness to your stock. At this point, what I would be doing is I would be removing all of the vegetables and all of the bones, and then I would be deglazing the pan with a little bit of water so that I don't use any of those bits. Then I would put, um, I'm actually gonna start putting them in here, and hopefully I will be able to demonstrate. And as you can see, I've used my roasting pan, my like Thanksgiving roasting pan to do this. Um, because this is going to cook. I'm basically going to let this stock cook for eight hours today. It's basically going to cook the entire day. So basically, as I explained, we're going to remove all the bones. We're going to take all the veg out. We're going to um, deglaze the pan and we will cover the bones that are in the pot that you can see right there. You want to make sure that you're covering it so that it's like two inches above that and you will let it simmer. And simmering means that you're gonna barely see a ripple over that water. If at any time the water level comes below the bones, you wanna be adding more. It's also really important that you start with cold water. You do not wanna be starting with hot water, okay? That's kind of a rule of thumb with all of the stocks that you're gonna be making. So the next one that I'm gonna be working on is my chicken stock. And again, I started that a little bit ago. One of the things that we're really lucky about here in Massachusetts is the bounty of local farms. So I talked about River Rock. I know that Chestnut Farm people, a lot of people get meat from them. I buy a lot of chickens from Codman Farm in Lincoln. 
And what I do is they also sell like other parts of the chicken. I like to make chicken stock with whole chickens. Whenever I roast a chicken, I like to save the carcass and I use that as well. So what I did for the chicken stock today, I actually was at Codman yesterday and the chicken stock that I'm making today, I'm actually making with chicken feet. Um, the beautiful thing about using chicken feet to make stock is that there there's a lot of gelatin in that portion of the of the chicken bone and it gives you a richness and there really is validity in many cultures around the world they do believe that these bone broths are medicinal and it's actually one of the reasons that i've been making a lot of it um, i'm really lucky my parents live in town they're healthy they're vibrant but they're in their 70s. And it really, was really important to me that I make sure that they stay healthy throughout this. So I've been making these bone broths and bringing them to them as well. And you can enhance them. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna grab the pot and show you a little bit about what's in there. So again, I had my chicken, my chicken legs, and I'm gonna take one out and show you one because I know that a lot of people haven't really seen one. So that's my chicken leg and I have about, this is about, can you see it? Can you move it a little bit closer to the camera? The yep, I can, I'm gonna move it this way. Can you do me a favor and take um, that? Can you move that out of the way? Oh, interesting. All right, so that's kind of what it looks like. I mean, it really is kind of what you would imagine, but there's just, there's really a lot of nutrition in there. And that too is also one of the most environmental things that you can do if you are, if you are an omnivore and you do eat meat, is you do want to make sure that you're using every part mm -hmm. of that, that of the animal that, um, that's been raised for our consumption. So same theory with the bone stock. We're using those bones to make those beautiful bone broths. We're using these chicken feet to make these beautiful, um, to make this beautiful chicken stock. In here, I also have onions, carrots, celery, and I also have a bouquet garni. So a bouquet garni, and what I'll do is I will include the slideshow that I was going to show you of the before and after. So this is my bouquet garni, and what I did was I took two celery stalks, and I used kitchen twine, and I used the celery stalk as sort of a little bit of a case, and I basically made a little bundle with sprigs of thyme, sprigs of parsley, bay leaves, and I tied the rope around it, and I put it into the stock. If you don't have those fresh herbs at home, you also have the opportunity, you can use cheesecloth. Can you go grab the cheesecloth for me? Do you remember where it is? Um, you can make a sachet of your bouquet garni using the dry herbs that you have at home. And I think that most people realize that in different cultures, people's chicken stock has some different flavors. So I, growing up in Puerto Rico, whenever we had chicken soup, there was also usually a hint of cilantro in it because that's kind of one of the mother herbs, if you would call it, that we use in our cooking in Puerto Rico and throughout Latin America. But if you were in Greece, you might find oregano, you might find you know, other things like that. So this is cheesecloth. You can buy it. It, it. Yes, my son just said that it looks like gauze. You can buy it, they sell it at Market Basket. I actually think that they have it at Wilson's as well. And basically you can just cut it into so the size that you use and make a little sachet. You can use the corners to tie it up or you can use that kitchen twine. And the reason we do this is that this enables us to basically lift those dry herbs because if you're using the dry ones, they're very, very small. And at the end of this, what I'm trying to do is get a very clean and clear stock. So I am gonna take, um, take those spices out of the oven. Sorry, out of the stock rather. Um, the other thing too is that if I were using a whole chicken, as I said, I'm very big, I do not like to waste food. And stock is really meant to be something, if you're peeling carrots, if you're chopping up onions, save all those scraps. Put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in a quart container, put them away in your freezer and then you can just add them to your stock. 
we actually do that in the restaurant, in the restaurant business, you know, when we're doing, you know, getting fruit to, um, veg ready, we're going to save that veg. We're going to save those pieces and we're going to add them to the stock because it just adds a richness to it. The chicken stock cooks for about three hours. But what I was saying is that I, if I'm using a whole chicken, what I will usually do is I will leave the whole chicken cooking. And when the chicken, the whole chicken is just about done, I will remove it from the stock and I will actually take all the chicken off the bones and I will return it. So when you see the slideshow, and I will annotate the slideshow so you understand what I'm talking about. When you start your chicken stock, you put the chicken that you've cleaned, you've cleaned the inside cavity, you've just you know, rinsed it off, you're putting it in your stock pot and you are covering it with cold water. Again, cold water. Because what you're going to do is you're going to bring that water to the boil. And the process of bringing the chicken, that water to the boil, is actually going to introduce, um, is going to take away all of the impurities from the chicken. So all the blood, all of that is going to rise to the top. And there really isn't a better word to describe it. It really does look like scum. It's like a gray foam at the top of it. And you can use a slotted spoon, you can use a ladle, but your objective is, is you want to get all of that off. You really don't want that stock to be boiling vigorously. So it's coming to the top and it's kind of when it's at the maximum, the maximum amount, like you've really got all of the impurities to come to the top, is really about the point that your stock is reaching a pretty aggressive boil. You want to take that heat down and you want to take it totally to low. And again, you want that baseline simmer. You do not want it going over that. And then after that, it'll cook for about another two hours. You don't really want to go much further than that because what then begins to happen is that the bones begin to disintegrate. And sometimes if you get, if you have made stock before, if you're getting a grayish tinge in your stock, it means that you've overcooked it and the bones have begun to disintegrate. Does anybody have any questions? You know, I, I really wish that I had the ability to give you some more visuals, but I will put together, as I said, some pictures to give you that. Um, but do any, and does anyone have questions until this point? Not yet. Okay. I, so keep I an have, eye on it. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, if, if you do kind of overcook your stock mm -hmm. and, and your bones have started, is there any problem with that? Should you no, not use it? Does it taste funny? Is there anything you can do to save no. it or? So what I would do is it's really, um, the other reason I have the cheesecloth, I am really lucky because I, I studied to be a chef. So I have lots of gadgets in my kitchen. So I have what we refer to as a chinois, which is, it looks, it's a, it's a cone shaped, um, it's a cone shaped um, sieve and it's extremely fine mesh. So it takes out a lot of those particles. Um, and what I do, if I, for example, I also put a layer of cheesecloth in it, and that also helps to take out the particles. It really won't impact the taste, but when we're making soups um, in fine dining, the objective is to get the clearest possible stock that we possibly can. So that, that's really why you know, we're, trying, we're trying to do that. So in terms of the veggies that I was using, so I used onion, carrot, celery. I often use leek as well, because um, I like the flavor of the leek. It's a white, it's yellow onions. You're not using a red onion, and that's what I use. And there's kind of, you know, I kind of use a, as a rule of thumb, like one, one of each per like three or four pounds of chicken. So one, one stalk of celery, one stalk of, you know, one carrot, um, the onion, right? That's kind of the rule of thumb that I use. Um, the other thing too is remember that depending on how long you're gonna cook your stock, that is the guidance for how big you make your vegetables. So my beef stock, you know, I'm cooking it, I'm cooking it for a long time, so it can be really chunky. My chicken stock, it'll be a little smaller. 
and the veggie stock that I'm about to demonstrate, those are actually going to be extremely small because it's only going to cook for 30 minutes. Okay. Tricia? Yeah. Courtney, Courtney would like to know, is the chicken cooked or raw? Can you use the bones from a chicken you've already cooked or eaten? So I, what I do is I do use the carcass. So the inner part of the chicken, um, I save those to use. And same thing with turkey, turkey bones as well. I will save those and aggregate them to help make a stock. The stock is going to be a little bit weaker, but that stock is also really good. Like if you're making, um, I sometimes use it to make my rice. I'll, I'll use the stock to add a little bit more flavor to it. I will use that stock to make, like if I were making something like a chicken pot pie, I have a chili recipe that calls for stock. So I, I will use that. Um, the whole point is, you know, those bones can really be used. I wouldn't recommend if someone's eaten the chicken, like if someone's eating the chicken off the bone. So what you could do if you wanted to save all the bones is you could actually debone the chicken. And it's actually something that's really easy to do. Um, I know that the library has a wonderful collection of books, um, cookbooks, um, Jacques Pepin's cookbooks, Julia Child's cookbooks. They all have very good instructions on how to break down a chicken. Um, and actually, I think there is a video on our website for the end because I've been post posting cooking classes on there as well on how to break down a chicken, um, which is another useful skill to have. So if you were making roasted chicken and you wanted to use those bones, you could really easily take the chicken off the bone, serve your family, serve your guests, and then reserve those bones to use at a later date. Also really important, if you're buying chickens that come with necks, the necks are fantastic. They're kind of like the equipment, they are the equivalent of the, um, of the chicken legs because they have the, all those good joints. And so all of that nutritious stuff is inside of the, you know, the joints between the bones. So also if you want to collect your chicken necks, that's another good thing that you can do. A lot of people also don't like to cook with the wings or serve the wings. So again, hack off those wings, add them to your collection of bones, and you can use those in your stock as well. Okay. So, and Betsy would like to know if you could do just a quick review of what veggies and what parts of the veggies do you put in stock? Sure. It's, it would be my pleasure. I actually have a bowl um, prepared to show you that. Okay, so this is what the bouquet garni looks like before it gets placed in the soup. So again, this is the celery. And if you noticed, I use the inner part. I, I really like using the inner part of the celery. Those leaves, those celery leaves are a really great source of flavor. So I do, so that's the thyme. I have sprigs of thyme. I have parsley. Um, and then I have some bay leaves and that's tied up so that I can fish it out really easily. So this is cut a little bit finer because these are the sections of the onion that I'm gonna use in my veggie stock. My carrot is also in about a one inch dice and my celery as well, okay? So those are the vegetables um, that we use when we go in our stock, okay? So I'm gonna put my stock back on the table. The other thing is, is that when I use, when I use a whole chicken, what I'll do is, as I said, I will take the chicken off the bone. And then what I'll do is I'll use the chicken breast to make chicken salad. And then I also, um, I think it's a memory of my grandmother. Um, my grandmother used to make really good chicken soup. And I, I really like boiled, like, a, bo like a, a perfectly poached boiled chicken is lovely. Um, and the French, you know, they make pot au feu. It's really, it's the simplest of dishes, but it's incredibly warming and soothing of the soul. And I think that right now, that's really the kind of food that we're all, you know, we're all craving. And really it's good for you, so it makes sense. So the next thing that I'm gonna work on is our veggie stock. I think it's really important that people have a veggie stock in their repertoire. Um, you know, as more and more people, we certainly have noticed at the end, we try to have, make sure that we have vegetarian and vegan options. Um, Hopefully some of you have been there, you've tried our tomato soup. Our tomato soup is vegetarian. Um, so these kind of stocks are really, um, and we also can make it vegan as well. And these kind of stocks really help um, in terms of making them. So what I'm gonna do is I usually have, um, I'm a big fan of mason jars. 
So I have a source of olive oil here. I'm gonna coat the bottom of this pan. Um, and I'm using this Le Creuset pan because I thought um, Le, this Le Creuset Dutch oven is a fantastic um, one to make soup in. The reason I'm using it is that I thought that it would be a good contrast for you to be able to see. So I'm actually gonna switch this up. I'm put the, putting this on a medium low heat. And what I'm gonna do is all of these vegetables that I have here, I'm gonna saute them for like three or four, maybe a little bit more, oops, as I am, uh -oh. sorry, my cameraman was being helpful in getting some, I'll get it honey, don't please just focus on that. Okay, so, I just want to point out to you, like this container that I used is actually a product. So as everyone is trying to make sure that they limit the amount of times they go to the grocery store, um, over the years I've really tried to find some products that make it easier for us to sort of save, to preserve our vegetables, to make them last a little bit longer. I buy organic berries. I buy organic berries and they tend to go really quickly. This is actually a Rubbermaid product. I don't understand the, what, how the technology works, but it actually has been extending the life of our berries, our vegetables. I put my broccoli in here, I put celery, lettuce. I have different sizes and it's just a really useful way for me to organize and extend the life of the food that we're buying. So in here I added, um, I also had garlic that I had slivered. And I'm going to just let this brown on here for a little bit. I'm going to actually give it a little bit more heat. Um, what we're doing is we're just trying to tenderize those, tenderize those vegetables a little bit. So I'm just going to let the that name go. Of that what was the name of that container? Um, it's a rubber, it's, I think it's like Rubbermaid Fresh Saver. Um, I've seen them. Um, something fresh. Is it fresh? Do you remember? Oh. You can find them on Amazon. If you look up, like, uh, if you look up, they actually have them at Bed Bath & Beyond as well. Um, I tried some different ones, and this one seems, uh, there were some that I found at King, the King Arthur Flower Store, but these actually seem to be the ones that work the best for me. So, while this is all going, I want to come bring you over here. And in here is actually chicken stock that I'd made before. And what I'm doing is I'm heating it up because I'm going to use it um, to be the base. We're going to do, um, we're going to make, celebrate a little bit of Cinco de Mayo. Even though I'm Puerto Rican, Mexican Independence Day, worth celebrating. And I thought it would be a good way for us to explain to you, you can put it right there, explain to you how, um, how we can use stocks in different ways. So I have the beef stock we talked about. I have my veggie stock that's getting ready to go. Um, Roy, can you do me a favor and yeah. fill that kettle up with water? You don't need to heat it up, just fill it all the way up to the top. Um, and then I'm also gonna show you really quickly how to make tortillas because that is sort of the basis of the tortilla soup. So I, um, we've been very fortunate to travel all over the world and I love trying to replicate meals that have been really special to me. And one of my friends is from Dallas, um, and there's a fantastic restaurant um, called The Mansion on Turtle Creek. And they're known for their tortilla soup, which is their interpretation of a very traditional Mexican dish. It is surprisingly easy to make tortillas. Um, and I've taken the, this opportunity, you know, during the, our stay at home, to try some things that I've always wanted to try. And making tortillas was one of them. Um, I had seen it done frequently. Um, we were really, really lucky to have, um, we, when I lived in London, the way that I was able to go to school at Le Cordon Bleu is that we had a fantastic nanny from Ecuador. And I learned a lot from her in terms of the Ecuadorian cooking traditions and then I was also really lucky here that we had somebody who helped with our family for 13 years and she was from Costa Rica. 
And her daughter used to tease us and say, are you taking care of the kids or are you and Trisha just hanging out and cooking? Um, because she became one of my closest friends and we actually did spend a lot of time. Um, and I got a chuckle because she's also, she's now living in North Carolina and she's posting cooking videos. And I laugh because she is now teaching other people how to make some of the things that I taught her. And likewise, I'm now teaching people how to do some of the things that she taught me. So you can buy uh, masa harina, the cornmeal, you can buy it at, um, I actually saw it, they had it at Wilson's, they have it at Market Basket. It's just cornmeal. And the dough couldn't be easier to make. You basically, it's two cups of masa harina to one and a half cups of water. And what I did was I mixed it together and I'm very big on portioning things so that they're equal. So I use an ice cream scoop and my kitchen scale to make sure that each of these individual balls of dough was pretty close, was even in size so that I would have even size for students. As you can hear, hearing, listening is an important part of what we do in the kitchen. I know that those vegetables are doing what they're supposed to be doing because I can actually hear the moisture coming out of them. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to add, this is about eight cups of water. And I'm gonna ask my production assistant, Maury, to give me a little bit more water and put it in there. All right, so I have my, my ball of um, tortilla masa. And I'm going to use the old fashioned method that I just taught. Yeah. Uh, actually half of it. So throughout Latin America, we all have our different um, traditions that are related to arepas or tortillas. In Puerto Rico, we make meat pies. I'm actually going to be doing some Puerto Rican cooking I on May 19th. And hopefully the camera will be all fixed by then. Um, and so my grandmother used to use a pot to flatten Actually, things out. Can you move your camera down a little bit so we can yep, see? Sure. Okay. So, and again, a trick, and it, it actually does say this on the, what I love is that it's actually incorporated on the, the arena bag, the flour bag, the corn flour. This is a Ziploc bag. And what I've done is I have placed um, I place I place the ball in the torch in the bag, and I flattened it with my saucepan. This is really high tech. And then I'm rolling it out with my rolling pin. So, in a lot of the Latin American cultures, they have you know tortilla presses. You know, just it's like metal that comes together. But as you can see. You know, it's a little bit uneven, but that's what a real tortilla looks like. So you can actually rip the bag at the seams, right? The tortilla came apart a little bit in the middle. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my tortilla, and actually this camera angle works. I'm going to put it right on my griddle. And I'm going to let it cook for about a minute. So the key to the tortilla soup is that that base of the tortilla soup and that little, that corn flavor actually comes from the fact that when they start their tortilla soup, they actually, um, they use older tortillas. So they use like day old tortillas and they saute them in the pan with the olive oil, with the oil that they use and use that as the basis to continuing sauteing the tomato and the onion and the cilantro that are the flavoring base for the tortilla soup. So I'm just gonna demonstrate one more time. These were, I, I made the dough. I made basically equal sized dough balls that I just, you know, with my hands. I'm putting it in between my very fancy, um, my very fancy Ziploc bag apparatus so that they don't stick. I'm taking my pot. I'm using my pot as the initial press. Yep. And now I'm going to use my rolling pin. 
And with my rolling pin, I'm just going, you know, the rule of thumb is in every, you know, you want to do sort of equal turns in every direction. How thick do you um, roll it to? Um, it's probably about an eighth, but it really kind of is your, you know, your choice, right? They work. Can you come here so we can bring the. All right. I flipped it. I, it, the rule of thumb is about a minute per side. Um, and I'm going to bring that. Actually, I'll bring it over here and I'll show you. And the beautiful thing, as I said, about ripping open the Ziploc bag is that it makes it really easy to just transfer it. I, I'm transferring it onto my hand. Yep. Do you actually, you can, why don't you take it off and we can show them. Yeah. So bring it over here so you can show it. So this is our homemade tortilla, right? And as you can see, it has that beautiful corn color in it, right? And what I'm going to do, can you go grab the cookie sheets that are on the dining room table? Um, what I do, like, usually the best thing to do is to cook them and serve them right away. Um, there was a request for Mexican food from my family tonight. So I'm making these homemade tortillas. Um, the tortilla soup that I'm talking about right now will end up sort of being the basis for that. Um, no, I flipped it. Oh, actually, you could flip it a third time if you wanted to get a little more brown mystery. Do you want to work on that? Yep, I had already flipped it once. So that's how I did um, the tortillas. And what I'm going to do is I am going to... I'm going to show you the base because I wanted to demonstrate making the tortillas. I didn't have any that were already used. Of course, you could use if you have tortilla chips at home, if you have tortillas um, that you have in your, if you had tortillas in your refrigerator, you could bake off the tortillas to take out a little bit of the moisture and then you could crisp them up. Um, Bob's Red Mill also makes um, a masa harina um, that is also really good. Um, and the beautiful thing about these tortillas um, that are made with corn is that they're gluten free. So you, if you have any members of your family or who are gluten intolerant, who have celiac, this is also a great alternative for them to have if you were looking, you know, for something, um, something like that. I'm going to do this in a little bit of a different order. I don't usually have all five of my stock pots in use at one time, but this is, you know, but I love doing it. So. Um, normally what I would do is I would start this off in a stock pot so because I don't um, have that extra one. I'm just, just going to use one of my heavy um, saucepans. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to coat the bottom of my pan with olive oil. And I'm going to, can I have that tortilla back? No, the one that I made. Fine. Oh, you're right. So I'm going to do this a little bit differently than what had been said, you know, just for purposes of demonstration. I am ripping up this tortilla and I'm putting it into the pan. And I'm going to put it sort of on a medium, on a medium heat. In the meantime, I'm going to demonstrate that I have some tomatoes. Um, these were just, um, these, you can basically, you can use a whole tomato. It's the equivalent of two cups. I used what I had in the house, so they were more the cherry tomatoes. So I just cut those out. I already had sliced some garlic. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to quickly cut this onion because what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly make a puree with the onion. When you're cutting the onion, you want to make sure that you're doing it safely. I cut through the, um, the part that keeps it together. I'm taking off the peel. And because I'm going to puree it, I'm going to put it, I'm going to cut it into, I'm going to do eighths. So if you are somebody who enjoys soups, um, and you were thinking of a particular something that might be useful in the kitchen, 
Um, I am a huge fan of my Vitamix. Um, I like vegetable-based soups. And the one that I have actually has the function. It takes like five or six minutes. You basically can blend the stock and the vegetable of your choice, and it creates like a vegetable puree. Um, it really is a lot of fun, especially at this time of year. I love asparagus. Um, and not everyone in my family loves it, so I tend to buy too much of it, and then I have it left over. So what I like to do is treat myself and make myself um, an asparagus soup. So as you can see right behind me, I have um, the onion. I did not drain the liquid from the tomatoes. I've kept that liquid. And that liquid will actually be really useful as I make this puree because it provides a little bit of moisture, which will actually help it um, a little bit. So I'm just gonna be a little loud. I'm just gonna puree this um, right over here. Beautiful. So that took maybe 30 seconds. So, so that was really good. All right, so we're gonna come back over here. See, and they're getting a little crispy, which is what I want. And now I'm actually going to saute all of this. It's a nice sound. So because of the moisture, this may splatter a little bit as the, the water is sort of evaporating out. And I also had about five or six cloves of garlic that I'm going to add to that. Rory, can you um, lift up a little bit? I don't think you can see. Okay, so right here, this is the vegetable stock. And that's okay. Like that boil is a little bit more aggressive than what we would have on our meat-based stocks but we don't have to worry about anything disintegrating. If the vegetables are becoming softer and we're getting that flavor out, that's really exactly what we want. So we can go back over there. So as um, I had talked about, you know, I often, I'm cooking stock a lot. So I always have a supply of chicken in my oven, in my refrigerator rather. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of those chicken breasts that I had from one of this, um, one of the soups that I, one of the stocks that I made earlier. And that's going to be the shredded, the shredded chicken that I'm going to use as the topping for my tortilla soup. So I'm going to let that cook off for another two or three minutes. The water is evaporating off um, from the, the puree of the tomato and the onion. Can you grab me some cilantro from, from right in there? Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix it with the chicken stock. So the other thing that I want to show you is I said I use mason jars all the time. So we use, um, I love to, I use tomato sauce all the time, but oftentimes I don't use it all at one time. So I found that the mason jars are the best way for me to save it because it also gives me a good visual marker of what I have. So this is about a cup of tomato sauce, and that's what I need for the recipe. The other thing that I'm going to do is, again, like I do not like to waste anything. So the tomato, this is, I use the tomato that's sort of in the box. And what I'm going to do to get the tomato sauce that's in the bottom of here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a ladle, and I'm going to ladle in some of the stock. And I'm going to use that to sort of clean, basically to clean out the tomato, the tomato box and put it in there. What's hard is that when we use these containers, there's probably like three or four tablespoons, which is the equivalent of a quarter of a cup. So you really do want to make sure that you're paying attention to some of those details so you're not wasting any of the food um, that you're bringing into the house. So I'm just going to grab a ladle. And of course, you want to be very careful of, you know, you don't want to burn your hands when doing this. Yeah, so I'm just going to swirl that around a little bit. Okay. 
So as you can see, some of that liquid is evaporating away. So this is getting a little bit more concentrated. I'm going to go ahead and add this to my stock. And I'm scraping up those, those tortillas and adding them as well. There we go. All right, so this is cleaned it out pretty well, as you can see, much better than it was before. And then I'm going to add the tomato. What are you making? This is tortilla soup. And again, you know, I still I guess these are some of the things that I learned from my dad's parents, who are from the southern part of Puerto Rico, were both amazing cooks. Um, and we were taught from an early age that you use it all. So there's my clean mason jar, my clean tomato box, and there's the base of my um, my tortilla soup. So what I'm gonna do right now is I will cook off the additional tortillas. Um, you know, I will cook those off later today. And then what I will do is I will cut them into strips because the beautiful thing about the tortilla soup is it's served, it served with garnishes. So you would serve it with fresh avocado, you would serve it with the shredded chicken, you would serve it with your strips of tortilla. And then people can sort of add as they want. And then they can also garnish it. Um, there's a beautiful, there's some different cremas, which means cream, that you can buy. Um, you can buy at Market Basket. They have a fantastic Latin American section. Um, and you, um, the crema is, it's a little bit tangier than sour cream. It's somewhere, it's not as thick as, it's a little bit thinner. So it's kind of the Latin American interpretation of sour cream or creme fraiche but it actually adds a really, if you add a dollop, that coolness of the crema adds a really nice touch um, to the tortilla soup. So a couple of questions. Yeah, please. Okay, um, Carrie, I'm gonna unmute you. Can you ask your question? Yeah, was the, um, was the- Hi, Carrie. Yeah. yeah. It's so good to see you. Oh, hi, Trish. Um, I had missed when you were sauteing sorte the tortilla in the pan. We, yeah. Did you take it out of the pan and and then put in the puree? No, I left, that... it. I left it in the pan. Oh, okay. Right? So, so does it, it sort of dissolve? It it's it's it still maintains a, like a bit of its texture. I mean, especially because if you had done it. The real way is that you would be using basically a tortilla that was stale, right? It, or that it's dry because it's a day old. So it does sometimes retain a little bit of that texture. But what you're trying to do is you're imparting that, that flavor of the corn. That's kind of what you're doing in the act of letting it um, do that. And it's interesting because there's other traditions that include breads in their soups right it's a really it's a it's a way to thicken your soup right, right. okay that's yeah. right okay it, 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 i mean it, it, i guess it's like the mexican equivalent of using a roux if you kind of think about it right um so it's just so interesting the way the interpretations you know different people use it bread is a great thickener right so instead of you know, using butter and flour that you're gonna use for something else, and why don't we just use what we have on hand, and we can use that to add a little bit of texture and thickness to our soup. And Jalen, you had a question about the tomatoes look like palmy. Love those, much better to use than canned because tomatoes yeah. are so acidic, they leach into the cans. So I, I, I use the palmy tomatoes. I really like the box tomato products. Um, I think, that I, I agree about, you know, set, sort of staying away from the cans. Um, I also like where they're sourced. Um, you know, I think probably given where we are right now, I probably, um, I like um, oven roasting tomatoes in the summer and concentrating those and using those as the basis for a lot of the things that I do. Um, you know, I had friends whose, whose families, like it used to be a summer activity that they would actually, they would make their tomato sauce for the entire year. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm that ambitious, but you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give it a whirl. Um, and if anyone wants to join me, we can turn, we can can some tomatoes or bottle some sauce in my kitchen this summer. 
So what I have here is cilantro. Um, people who tell you that it tastes like soap, it really does yeah. taste like soap to them. It, it, it is a genetic, some people have a genetic, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would call it a mutation or a genetic variation. Um, Rory wants to see if he eats it, he, it's in a lot of the food that he eats because it's, as I said, it's part of the whole, it's part of the holy grail of Latin American cooking. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I am going to, I'm just going to rinse this really quickly and dice it up and I will have it to put into this soup. When I make chicken soup, um, I have several variations. Um, as a Puerto Rican Jew, I get to celebrate lots of cultures. So we make a mean matzo ball soup around here. So the matzo ball soup, what I do for that is I tend to, I saute in a pan separately from the stock. I will saute carrots, celery, um, and I sometimes will saute leek as well in a really beautiful olive oil with salt and pepper. And I do it till it's just al dente. And then I, when I serve my soup, I put the broth in, I put in the sauteed vegetable, and then I put in my matzo balls. Um, and I do it so that, because I don't like the vegetables to be mushy. If I were doing a Puerto Rican style chicken soup, um, I would be dicing up cilantro. There probably would be a little bit of oregano. And I also, um, as a tribute, um, my best friend in Puerto Rico, her parents were also great cooks and they had four children and their two older daughters, there was a big age difference. And lunch was a, is a very big meal mm -hmm. or was in Puerto Rico. And I love their cooking so much. And they were always trying to get Evia to eat. My best friend, she didn't, she was skinny as a rail, didn't really like to eat a lot, but I loved to eat. So I would go and I would eat lunch at their house or dinner. And then I would go home and eat again at my house. Um, I think my parents finally caught on, but they were fine with it because I also was a pixie too. Um, but my, the chicken soup that I make, the Puerto Rican style chicken soup, is definitely a tribute to Miriam and Nestor, her parents, who just, you know, their table was the essence of everyone was welcome, lots of rambunctious noise, and just a lot of joy. So I think that that's one of the reasons I, I like some of these recipes is that they take me back to those moments. Um, so I really enjoy that. So I'm just gonna give this a quick rinse. And again, people ask, um, you know, do you use the, you know, do you use the whole part of it? I will use the whole, depending on the usage, you know, if it's a pretty garnish that just requires the leaves, then I'm obviously gonna need to pay close attention and take off all of those leaves. But for something like this, um, I would probably use a little bit um, of the stem as well. Trisha, yeah. you want to know if you can if cornmeal can substitute for masa harina. Um, it is a little bit different. The cornmeal is not as fine. Can you do me a favor, Rory? Can you grab the masa harina? It's on the bottom. I'm gonna have Rory grab the masa harina so I can actually show you the consistency. Arena means flour. So this is maseca. This is probably the most popular product that's sold. But as you can see, that looks more like flour than cornmeal. If you had a really fine grain cornmeal, it might work. I'd try it. I mean, it, it can't hurt to try it. I'm gonna drain the vegetable, um, the vegetable broth so you can see what that looks like. Um, having the onion, that onion peel will add to the color of it. The other thing is if you have mushrooms, if you have broccoli, save those veggie trim, save the veggie trim, put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in your freezer, and you can also add that to your stocks as well. Um, people tend to use a lot of mushroom. The mushroom tends to add a beefiness to the vegetable stock. Um, I, my family's not a really big, I love mushrooms, but some of the members of my family are not the biggest fans of it. So I don't tend to have them around, um, but they really are a beautiful, beautiful um, product to use um, in your vegetable stocks. If you have access to like the dry porcini or the dry cremini, you can reconstitute them with boiling water and add them to your stock and they will really add a nice flavor. So I'm gonna use 
this as my makeshift sieve today because I want to be able to put this into um, a small bowl so I can hold up the broth for you to see. Oh, that color is beautiful. Ooh, be careful. My mason jar is coming in handy yet again. Okay. Oh, the color of this is spectacular. Can you move your camera down again a little yep. bit? Can you see it? Perfect. So that's my veggie stock, right? And again, I can use this as a stock if I'm making, um, you know, whatever soups I'm making that I want to make vegan or vegetarian, I can use that. Um, it just, it has, what I love about it is it, it smells like a garden, right? It smells like the freshness of all the vegetables. And I think that's really the essence of what the stock should be. So I've taken us to 11 o'clock. I will put together the slideshow and I also will, set, will send along pictures of what I'd hoped to show you when I was able to share my screen.